Hi there, my name's John Arnold and this is PhotoWalkthrough.com. Today we're starting tutorial number 7 and for the first time the voting on the home page has been almost tied. For those of you that don't know, we have a What's Next section on the PhotoWalkthrough.com home page where I give you guys the chance to vote on what you'd like to see me cover in a future tutorial. I alternate between covering the image you vote for there and an image of my choice and that lets me occasionally bring in images where I've used a technique that I've not shown you before. So if you've not looked at the website before or if you want to guide the direction of the show please visit there and vote on the home page and perhaps you can also email me on photowalkthrough at gmail.com if you've got comments or suggestions. Uh, you can also join the Photo Walkthrough group on Flickr and post some of your images and see the images of some of the other viewers there. Uh, please do consider joining in there if you're interested in improving your photography. It's the very best way um, to improve, uh, to give and receive critique, and Flickr is a great place to do that. Um, also this week, I've had a couple of emails from viewers asking why they can't view these tutorials on their video iPods. Now the reason for that is that I record, for th record them at 800 by 600 resolution, and that's too large for the iPod screen. When I first started, I really felt that to see properly what was going on, uh, I needed the largest screen size I could get. However, the, uh, um, the iPod is not big enough to display the 800 by 600 size that I chose. Um, but I'm going to try an experiment this time. I'm going to produce two versions of the show, one at the regular 800 by 600 size and one at the iPod screen size. So if you're an iPod video owner and you would like to receive the show in a format that you can watch on your iPod, please email me at photowalkthrough at gmail.com and I'll mail you back telling you where you can find the test feed. If I get enough interest and if people feel it's useful when they've seen it, I'll consider making it a permanent fixture. OK, let's get going. You can see the image we'll be covering today here. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to cover something that came up on the Flickr group this week. So let me just show you that. This is an image posted by Michelle van Helden. Uh, it's the La Trappe Klusterbrauerei. And I have to admit that I almost considered not including this segment because I wasn't sure how to pronounce that. But Michelle went to the trouble of sending me an audio clip of how to say it. Check it out. La Trappe. I guess the English translation would be something like La Trappe Cloister Brewery, and it's a beer brewery run by monks. Anyway, as you can see, it has this really interesting frontage that blends a kind of Gothic style with red brick Industrial Revolution style. Uh, there are a couple of things I really like here. I think if you're going to shoot something, you really need to make deliberate choices about where you're going to stand and how you're going to compose it. If you want front on, then make sure you're nice and central. If you want three quarter view, then make sure you're nicely off to one side. Consider what parts of the image of you'll be looking at, and in the shot, uh, place, take care to place them nicely within the frame. In this case, Michelle got nicely central and placed the statue right in the foreground as though he's welcoming you to the building. Michelle also managed to get the whole building in shot, so there's nothing leading your eye out of the shot. Uh, so this is Michelle's version of the shot, and you can see what he's trying to do here. He's added a lot of contrast. Let me just show you the layers. He's uh, added a lot of contrast with this curves layer here. That's just a, a regular S-curve layer. Um, he's also darkened up the sky and added a load of colour there, which I really like. Um, he's done some dodging and burning to bring out some detail, which is great stuff. And in the process, he's tried to darken down this part of the sky here. Um, and one other thing that he's done that I must just mention, this very first layer he's added here is a copy of the background layer. And I think, I think Michelle, you've, added, you've done some sharpening on that layer. Um, now, one thing um, you should consider is doing your sharpening at the end of the process, not at the beginning. The reason for that is that if you... Um, if you're going to export the image at different sizes, so you maybe do the full size version for printing and maybe a smaller version for putting on the web, uh, then it's best to do the sharpening at the intended resolution. Uh, that way your sharpening is working on the actual pixels that you'll eventually be exporting rather than adding some sharpening pixels and then resizing them. The, the quality of your sharpening will be better and the final image will look better. So do your sharpening right at the end of the process um, and sharpen every time you export the image at, a, at whatever size you're going to export it at. So um, right, let's, let's look at how, how we can approach this image. Um, the first thing I think it needs is a quick crop. Um, this we're nicely central on the building, or, or pretty cl close enough for it not to be uh, not to be too far off. Um, I'd like this guy 
central. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just do a quick crop. Um, and having played around with it a little bit before, I think 5x4 works quite well for this image. Whoops. So I'm just going to do a quick 5x4 down to there. And I think that looks pretty good. Um, if you wanted to be really ambitious or dramatic, you might go for a one for a one to one, which would be a square crop. This has come up a few times in the um, in the Flickr group as well this week. Square crops can be really dramatic if you get them right. It's tricky to get this central. Something that might just help. If you click on the ruler and drag it down, you can use that so that you can see how my crop is crossing the building at about the same point on both sides. So that would be, let me and then grab your move tool to drag that ruler back out of the way. So that might be a nice one-to-one -one crop. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to stick with the uh, uh, the four by five crop for today. So that's that. And um, the reason that Michelle actually uh, posted, or the question that he posted, um, was to do with the fact that this sky here is quite a lot lighter and actually a slightly different colour in the top right here than it is in the top left. So. Um, I'm going to just quickly show you how to correct that and in the process we'll also cover um, selecting by color range, saving and loading selections uh, and uh, how to use some of those saved and loaded selections to do selective, selective edits on the image. Um, so having done the crop, um, the next thing is to select just the sky portion of the image. Um, now I'm going to turn off Michelle's edits here um, because these sort of edits, this is this is an evening up edit. Um, it's one of the first things I tend to do to my images, is look for parts of the image that are, that are uneven or distracting and try and, and just sort those out. So this sky is indeed, you know, clearly the sun is just off to the right here, um, and it has left this portion of the sky up here quite a lot brighter and a lot more cyan. This is this is a more sort of uh, magenta blue, and this is a more cyan blue. Um, so I'm just going to start my own selection of edits here. And the first thing I would do here is I would probably approach this problem with a hue saturation layer, but I only want that to apply just to the sky. Uh, and there's a mantra in Photoshop. This is um, select then correct. Um, and that means make sure you select the portions of the image that you want to edit before you actually do the edit so that they only apply to those areas. And there's a very useful tool in the select menu here called color range, which will allow us to select those blues. But rather than select those blues directly, I'm actually going to, I'm just going to select my background. And I've showed you this before, but if you do control one, that shows you the red channel data. Control two shows you the green channel data. And the one we'll want today, control three shows you the blue channel data. And the reason we're going to use that for our selection here is that as you can see, out of all the channels, it's the one that has the most contrast between the building and the sky, and it's the sky I want to select. So having chosen Control 3 with a bitmap layer selected, I'm now going to go to Select Color Range, and that will pop up this dialog here. And What this is showing us here is it's going to say, right, we're going to sample some parts of the image and say I want to select that color within the image. And then you can choose your fuzziness slider, to select more or less around that color. Now, in this case, what I'm actually going to do instead, I'm going to leave my fuzzy, fuzziness slider really low, maybe around 10, uh, maybe around 5. Yeah, about there. Um, and I'm going to, having clicked on one place in the sky, I'm going to hold down the Shift key, and you can see that puts a little plus on my cursor. And I'm going to keep selecting different colors in the sky. Going to try and select those, some of those blues up above the top of the building as well. Okay, just looking for places where it's not, where I've got some pink. You can see the red bits are the bits that are not selected, and the white bits are the bits that are selected. And then I'm just having done that, I'm just going to play with my fuzziness slider and make sure I'm getting all the sky tones I want. So probably I'm going to end up around 10, aren't I? So there. I've pressed OK on that, and you can see straight away that we've got marching ants around the sky, and we've got a couple of other little bits and bobs selected, but we can take those out of the selection. Um, there's a very useful quick mask mode in Photoshop. If you press, having with the marching ants selected like this, if you press the Q, Q key on your keyboard, 
it'll jump into this red and white selection mode again and with your brush and with black as your foreground I'm just going to paint over those little bits that were selected that I don't want. So there's a bit of building there that was selected. There were a couple of highlights on these windows that were selected that I don't want. So I'm just painting black on this mask now and that's just painting out the selection. So what we'll end up with if I press Q again to go back to marching ants mode you can see now we've just got the sky. Now that's a pretty useful selection. We're going to need that selection again and again on this image. So I'm going to save that selection. So I'm going to go to the select menu and I'm going to choose save selection and I'm going to give it a name, sky. And for those of you that are interested, what that actually does is it makes a new channel. So if you go to the channels palette, you can see we've now got a sky channel here. But that will continue to be available as a load selection there. So we've, we've got the sky selected. We no longer want to be in the just in the blue channel. So um, once again, I'm going to do control and the top left key on your keyboard, which is the one to the left of the one. And I've mentioned this many times. Uh, I don't know what it is on every keyboard in the world. But on a UK keyboard, it's the back quote key. On an American keyboard, it's the tilde key uh, or tilde key, depending on who you believe. Um, so uh, yeah, that control and the top left key gets you back to the red, green, blue channel. Um, and if you're really stuck, you can just go to the channels palette and click on the RGB channel there. So we've now got um, just the sky selected. And what I'm going to do is try and even up those colors in the sky. So going back to my, my, select, my group of edits, I'm going to create a hue saturation layer. So I've gone to the new um, adjustment layer button there. Again, you can get to that through new adjustment layer here as well. Hue saturation, and I'm going to call this level sky colors. Right. Now, next thing we're going to show you. Um, I just want to work on the blues in the sky. Uh, I know we've already made a selection, so we're only selecting, uh, uh, editing the bits in the sky. But I'm just going to be double cautious here. Um, so I'm going to choose the blues and I'm going to as well as just choosing the blues I'm going to click in the sky on the colors that I want to edit and what that will do um, I've shown you this before but I'll just mention it again these are your input colors at the top of this strip here and these are your output colors and what you've got here is a little selection doohickey I can't think of anything else to call it a little selection thing that shows you what you've got selected so this darker section here is the colors that are going to be 100% affected by this change. And then out towards these little buffers at the end here, the gray area is is less and less and less selection. So the, the colors that, that are on the input strip here will be less and less and less affected the further out they go, and likewise this way. So in this case, we've got just the blues 100% selected. And as we go into the magentas, the, the edit will be less and less uh, visible. And as we go into the science, the edit will be less and less visible. So if I want to center this selection on the particular color that I want to edit, I can click on the image. With, and, and you can see when I put my cursor over the image, we get the little eyedropper. So if I click, that selection is now moved. So the color I clicked on must be right here, slap bang in the middle of that region. Just for comparison, I'm going to click over here as well and watch the, watch the selection jump again. See, that's, that's more towards the blues. That's more towards the cyans. So that's already telling us that this section over here, if I want to make it look more like that, we're going to need to move the colors here more towards the blues. So I'm going to just try and get an idea of roughly where my selections are. And I'm going to now just drag that selection so that it's pointing at, it includes both the colors I want to work on. and. The next thing I'm going to do, I've got my blue selected, uh, I've got my region colors, my colors selected. I'm going to just do an initial first draft edit. Now the first thing I notice here is this this uh, this region here is quite a lot lighter than this region, so I'm going to drag the lightness down, and you'll notice it's affecting over here as well. But I'll sort that out. I'm going to drag the lightness down, and as you drag the lightness down or up, in fact, you'll find that you lose saturation. So I'm going to drag my saturation up. And I already know that I need to drag this color toward, more towards the blue, so I'm going to drag my hue to the right just a little bit, just a little for now. And I'm going to press OK on that. 
Now you can see when it created this hue saturation layer, it's created it straight away with a layer mask. And because I had a selection at the time, it's created the layer mask with the bit that was selected white and the bit that wasn't selected black. So already this edit is only affecting the sky. If I turn that layer on and off, you can see. If I was to shift click that, uh, that's turning on and off the layer mask. You can see with the layer mask not turned on, it's actually affecting the windows as well. So, um, but that's not enough. I, 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 obviously, it needs to affect just this part, not this part. So what I'm going to do next, um, I'm going to go back and load the selection that we chose earlier. So I've gone select, load selection, and now I'm going to choose sky. And that gets us the selection we made earlier back. And now I'm going to use a circular gradient. So I'm going to go to the gradient tool here. I'm going to choose the circular gradient there. And I want uh, black to white. No, I don't. I want foreground to background. I do apologize. So I've got white and black. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I want white to black. So where I start my gradient, so the, the sun is over here. I want, there's a sort of, a, if you imagine this color problem, it's sort of radiating out from around the sun. So the sun is the center of our circle. And the opposite part of the sky from the sun is the other, the outside of our circle. So I'm going to just click as close to the edge as I can as the center of our gradient and as close to this edge as I can for the end of our gradient. And what that's done is it's, if, if I wish to show you the, um, the layer mask, you can see just within the area that I've got selected, because remember when you've got marching ants like this, any edits you do will only apply within the selected area. So I've got the white part of my gradient here, the dark part of my gradient here, and you can see this is just a radial, it's a bit hard to see actually here, but it's a radial edit, it's a radial gradient, sort of like a like a big glowy dot with black around it. So that's my edit so far, and you can see already that's starting to look a lot more even. Let's go back into our hue saturation again, go back and choose our blues again, and I think I still need to go a little darker with the lightness slider, and I need to add quite a lot more saturation with my saturation slider. My hue is pretty good, but I could probably go just a little bit more towards the magenta. And I think that looks pretty good. Let's just turn that on and off. That's pretty good. OK, I can deselect that. We can see the edit in its finished form. Let's drag that into, into my edits group there. Uh, I probably overcooked that just a little bit. Just going to drag that back opacity slider down a little bit just to back off the change. I think that's pretty good there. Now, um, having saved this selection and having evened up the sky like this, um, there are other things we can do. I'm just going to press my F7 key, which is my action for adding a contrast layer. I've covered that before. I'm not going to mention it again today. Um, if I wanted to add some lightness at the bottom of the... the I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this image and I see this, this fella here and this cross here, and just this whole shape here, is probably the main focus of the image. So if I wanted to do, um, let's say, a lightning layer, I'm going to press my F5 key to do a lightning layer. Um, and that's created a lightning layer with a completely white layer mask. Um, so let's reload our selection, our sky selection. And this time, I want to affect the building, not the sky. So I need to invert the selection. So select Inverse. And this time, with my Gradient tool, um, I'm going to use a linear gradient, which is just a straight straight line gradient. Uh, and I'm going to do white at the bottom and black at the top, just to try and bring the attention of the image more towards the bottom here, because this is where I would really want the views of this image looking, I think. So let's just try that without that on, with that on and off. Oh, and I can see that my light is still affecting the sky. So I've still got this selection selected. Let's just go back and do select inverse again. So I've got the sky selected. And now I can do, because black is my background color, I can do control delete or command delete on, an, on a Mac and that fills that selection with black. So those, those sky portions of the image are now filled with black. So let's turn that layer on and off and we're just 
affecting the, the foreground of the building there. And one final final edit, let's just quickly add a sky gradient in. Um, we've still got that sky selected, but if we didn't remember, we could just do select load selection. Um, and I'm going to add, uh, let's do a soft light layer. So let's do a new, a new regular layer. Let's call it soft light. And let's set it to soft light blending mode. I'm going to press um, D to get black and white in my colors. Um, again, with the gradient, I'm going to choose, this time I'm going to choose foreground to transparent, which is the second in the gradient editor. And my foreground color is black, which is what I want. So with my gradient tool selected, I'm going to draw a line down to about there and that will just I'm going to press control D that deselects the selection and that just puts a little bit more color into the sky and as I said before I really like the um, oh, we still need more color on the front of the building let's just drag my contrast layer right up I really like the contrast of the red brick against the blue sky it's uh, it, it just gives an interesting dimension to the image, and I think that was one of the things that Michelle's edits did very well. So, um, so there are a couple a couple of edits just using the save selection we used, um, and also uh, a little bit about leveling up those colours in the sky. You know that edit. I'm, I'm going to end up dragging that sky leveling edit back up to 100%. Um, so there we go. I think that probably answers Michelle's question. Um, I think I'll, uh, um, I'll leave it there. This has taken quite a lot of time, um, and there's a lot of techniques in that. Um, I think it's time we got started on our dis distorted tree image. Um, so let's take a look at that. Right, this is our distorted tree image. Um, and I think probably what I'll do today, rather than doing any edits today, we'll just make a plan, and I'll just quickly explain what I was thinking with this image. Um, and then next week we can start doing some edits. Um, as you can see, there's a sort of a, a dreamlike feeling to this shot, and that's quite deliberate. I've taken elements of holgography and worked them into this shot. And for those of you don't, that don't know what holgography is, um, there are some wonderful old, very cheap cameras called Holgers. Uh, and the image they, images they take are the absolute opposite of the wonderfully sharp, evenly lit images that the modern digital cameras produced. Uh, Holger images are typically soft focus with very uneven light. Usually they defocus and darken towards the edges. Um, and they can be very atmospheric pictures when they're done well. Uh, and I wanted to steal some of those elements for this shot. So uh, let's have a look at the original of this. Let's just go down to the background layer and I'm just going to press alt and click on the eye on the little eye symbol next to the background there and that turns off all but the background layer so uh, as you can see it's it's quite a different image um, what interested me here were the shapes in the tree um, and I was able to find an angle that separated the tree nicely from any of the surrounding trees that let me the other, throw the other trees out of focus a little by using a large, large aperture um, and I really wanted to focus on just this one tree, uh, and particularly I liked the way this, this branch sort of curved off out of shot here with these other two branches making this sort of U shape behind it. Um, it was those shapes that drew me to the shot. Um, it, it's one of those occasions where I looked at the scene and immediately I could see in my head how I wanted it to look. This was black and white in my head before I even lifted up my camera. Uh, the tricky bit here is the sky, which was much brighter than everything else that day. It was quite a sunny day, but obviously I'm in among trees and it's shady there. Uh, and I didn't want to blow out the sky because I knew that would cause blooming into the detail of my shot. When you blow out a, um, a region of an image, quite often you get sort of um, light fringes going out of the blown out region into the detail uh, of the adjacent parts of the image. Uh, that's called blooming, and I didn't want that to happen. Um, so I, I ended up exposing it and just getting the sky in the right sort of um, in, in the right levels, um, but keeping the rest as light as I could, um, so that I knew I would have uh, sufficient detail in the rest of the shot to do what I wanted to do. Um, but it's given us this quite flat-looking image. But I can sort that out. That's something I knew I could I could fix in in Photoshop. So what's the plan? Well, um, just looking at this, I've got the 
I've got the branch I wanted here, I've got these branches I wanted here, and the light just where I wanted it, I wanted to show off this detail in the, in the bark here, um, I wanted the, the shapes to all sort of flow through the shot. Um, there's a couple of things that distract, there's a piece of litter just there that needs to go, that's probably my first edit. Um, obviously we need to do a black and white conversion on this, um, so let's just quickly looking at this, I'm going to do that same trick I showed you just a moment ago, control, uh, hang on, let's go back to my background layer, control 1 shows me the red channel, control 2 shows me the green channel, control 3 shows me the blue channel, the blue channel is really going to show up that that bright sky which is definitely not what I want so I don't think I'll be using the blue channel at all here the red channel is is nice um, even light that's probably the main useful channel here but the green channel is showing me more detail on the bark so I will certainly keep some of the green channel in probably mostly red some of the green none of the blue um, so I'll definitely need to do a, um, a black and white conversion um, it's definitely going to need more contrast because of the way I shot it is looking quite flat. Um, I'm going to have to sort out that overly bright sky and uh, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use a, um, a hard light burn layer and in the process of hard light burning it I'm going to start bringing the, the darkness into the edges like a, like a Holger image. Um, and I'm going to want to draw attention to this detail on the bark here. I'll probably do some dodging and burning to bring that out and then finally I'll do some selective sharpening and de-sharpening de just to um, add to that sort of dreamlike feel. I'll, I'll soften it out towards the edges of the shot and I'll sharpen on those parts of the parts of the bark where I want the detail. Okay, um, sorry we've not made much progress on this image today um, but that's enough. Um, thank you for watching. Um, I'm afraid I'll be away on yet another holiday next week. Um, I'm going to pre-record a show and do my best to release it on Monday, but I'll be in Wales and I doubt I'll have internet access while I'm there. So my apologies if I'm unable to release the show next week, um, but I will obviously release it as soon as I'm able. Uh, don't forget, if you've not voted yet this month, please vote for us on Podcast Alley. Remember, you can vote for more than one show if there are other podcasts that you listen to as well. And I promise that that will be my last nag about this for this month. Um, thank you for watching, folks. I will catch you next time.